First of all, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll conclude the welcomes. We'll talk about the purpose of the research initiation grants briefly. You see there's a little agenda in the lower left-hand corner. We'll talk about the purpose of the rigs. We'll talk about the focus on innovation and learning, because those are two stumbling blocks that we sometimes hit with proposals. Then we'll, uh, we'll take a look at the website, um, and we'll remind you that the proposals are due by November 17th and, and take questions. So if you have questions, we don't have to wait till the end. You can go ahead and type them in the chat box, and we'll take it, you know, as they come up. I see Lee is typing. Leo is typing, so maybe we'll have a question coming in. Okay, Leo says go ahead. He can hear, and so we can't hear him, but he can hear us, so he can communicate through the chat window. That's great, Leo. All right. So the purpose of the RIG program, these are research initiation grants. And the purpose is to stimulate research and development around online innovations that will influence learning. So we're trying to help Penn State move forward in the area of online innovations. We think that online tools are really important in learning, and they're going to become increasingly important as the tools get better and better. We'd like to be a place where some of those tools are created. We'd like Penn State faculty, staff, and students to have the opportunity to actually implement good ideas that they have. Uh, sometimes you have a good idea, but you need some money to get things built, and you need some opportunity to research things. You need data that shows that it's a good idea, so that then you can turn that over to a, a larger funding organization, like the uh, National Science Foundation or the Department of Education. It seems if you have data that something works, then you can get money to expand that. But it seems difficult sometimes to get a project out, you know, off the ground. And so that's what these research initiation grants are for. They're to start these research and development projects. They don't have to be development, but they can be development. And to support you to the point where you have evidence that your idea is a good idea, and you can take it further and get investment from either foundations or from uh, government agencies or from perhaps private investors to go ahead and, and build a product that's going to do good things in terms of improving learning. So our center is called the Center for Online Innovation in Learning. And that's important. It's not innovation in online learning because some of the learning that you could be creating online tools for, online innovations for, can be classroom-based learning. So I want to point out that it's not all about online learning, although, you know, a lot of residential learning does happen online. So uh, we just want to clarify that a little bit, and uh, with that, we'll, uh, I'll stop briefly and see if there are any questions about the intent. Seed grants for innovative projects that will improve learning, that have the potential to bring you know, further study, further um, investment so that we can move ahead and develop real uh, products that, that make a difference for learners. I'll pause a moment, see if there are any questions. You can raise a hand. There's a hand raising icon. Uh, and there's also uh, at the top of the screen by the microphone and camera button, and there is uh, the opportunity to type in the chat window. Seeing no hands raised and no questions in the chat box, I'll move ahead. So the next thing is to draw your attention to the call for proposals that's posted on the COIL website. So uh, Brad has the Center for Online Learning, our COIL website, uh, up on the screen uh, below the cameras here. And uh, he's at a site. If you go to the COIL website, there's a, 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 um, there's a, there are a series of menus that you can use to pull down. There's a research initiation grants menu on the right-hand right side. And if you pull that down, see Brad's going there now, COIL rig, call for proposals will take you to the page that he's at right now. So at the very top of the page, COIL rig for research initiation grant call for proposals will bring up all the information 
uh, as well as a place you can volunteer as a reviewer. So one great way to understand the process is to be a reviewer, and then you'll understand how the points are awarded. We'll, we'll help you understand that by the end of the call today. We also need reviewers, and it's good to hear those conversations and to understand the kinds of things that fly and those that don't. And then there's also, the, this is also the place where you will submit your research initiation grant proposal. All the proposals will come in through this website by the deadline. And uh, if it doesn't, and here Brad's taking you to the submission form right there. So you submit, you fill out this little form, uh, attach a PDF, and send it to us. And if you send it some other way, if you email it to me or to Brad, we may not find it. <laughs> Sorry about that. But this is the one way we know we can get everybody's uh, submissions in one place. Know that they're all in on time, so this is how you turn them in. Back to the call for proposals. Uh, we try very hard to spell everything out, everything you need to know. The purpose of the program, who's eligible, basically that's anyone, by the way, faculty, staff, or students, can be uh, the, the principal investigator on these. Uh, we like collaboration a lot. So we really like to see faculty, staff, and students working together. We really like to see uh, faculty from different academic programs and different campuses working together. We like to see collaboration with other institutions. Uh, we have this philosophy that all of us is smarter than any of us, and that no matter who you are, uh, most of the best people in the world don't necessarily work for you. And so we want to encourage collaboration and uh, uh, just keep that in mind. And if you'd like help in finding collaborators, we have a great tool that maybe we'll show you at the end here, a place to go and find collaborators. And you can also just submit requests to us, and we will help you find the right people if you don't know the right people to work with you on, on something. So collaboration is, uh, is important to, to us. Deadlines. Uh, deadlines are listed here. We do this twice a year. The current two rounds are November 17th. If you find that a challenge and you'd like to go ahead and maybe review proposals this time and submit in the uh, spring, the next call will be on May 15th. Proposals will be due on May 15th. Uh, in the use of funds section, <clears throat> basically, we want to point out that, that we, you can use the funds for research. You can use the funds for, for development. Uh, you can use the funds to pay for things you can't normally pay for. Uh, now let me put that differently. I, I was going to say you can't normally pay for at Penn State. What I mean by that is you can't use them for things that you can normally uh, get paid for by Penn State. In other words, like a computer. If you need a computer, now. Faculty members have computers. We're not going to buy our faculty members' computers. Faculty time is another one that we sort of try to stay away from because faculty members at Penn State generally have time that they can devote to research. If there's something special about your circumstance where you, as a faculty member, you have so many other obligations or you're the only person who can teach these courses and they need to be taught, we'll entertain um, some summertime from faculty members. But in general, we understand that staff is, doesn't quite work that way. And if you're an instructional designer, for example, you have a workload up to here already. And if you want to work on a new project, then something's going to have to go. Somebody else is going to have to work on one of the things you're doing. So you might need funding to hire an instructional design, another instructional designer or an intern or something to fill your shoes. So it's all kind of explained in this section, but stay away from asking for a lot of money for faculty time because faculty time is expensive and there is time. Faculty have time for research, and if it's important, you should probably be able to make that happen. There are exceptions as are, special, uh, as are specified here. Any questions about that? I see one in the, uh, in the chat box. Mary uh, is asking. <clears throat> Would fixed-term faculty fit under this? For example, getting dollars for faculty time, yes. 
So if you do need to pay for, for like tenure track faculty members time, you could use the replacement cost. So if you need to buy somebody out of a course, rather than paying for X percent of that faculty member's time, if it's going to cost you Y thousand dollars to get somebody to replace that person, um, you know, a fixed term faculty member, we would be able to entertain that option. And you can also use people who are our fixed term faculty members um, as, as people who work on these projects. So we're really just trying to avoid paying for time that can be you know, made available through Penn State's existing financial structure. I don't know if I answered that sufficiently, Mary Dean. Okay, great. Any other questions related to what you can and can't use these for? Travel is one thing we do uh, recommend. So we will support travel out to present at conferences uh, based on your COIL work. We do support you bringing experts in to Penn State to talk with your project and to inform your project and perhaps to do another, you know, a, a series of speech, speeches or meet with students or something. If there are other experts you want to bring in, that's good. We, we don't, some grants sort of frown on travel money. We don't. We think that's an important part of what goes on. Okay, uh, let's scroll up to uh, funding priorities there, Brad. Thank you. So the bottom line is we're looking for projects that are going to positively influence learning. So that's really important. We're looking for innovation too. So we're not just looking for you to take an existing proven technology and use it in an area that's never been done before. In other words, let's say that um, a particular type of data warehouse or, or, or uh, resource repository has never been used in in uh, the area of, let's say, dental hygiene. And there's a lot to be gained by using these proven techniques to improve dental hygiene all over the world. Uh, no, that's not, we're interested in doing good things for the world, but it has to be innovative. There has to be something innovative about what you're studying or what you're building, or what you're doing. Uh, it's not just money for good things. Oh, I gotta get my scan. This is good. They want to scan my computer, and we don't want that happening. Okay, so um, so innovation that improves learning, and uh, you know, just because it's new to your field doesn't mean it's an innovation. Any questions about that? Okay, see, so yeah, Leo had a question about using funds for a graphic designer uh, from China because it's cheaper. The answer is yes. Uh, you could also use it to hire a graphics designer, uh, you know, from here. But yes, if you want to hire somebody, use that money to hire somebody that's not here, uh, not in the country, that's fine too. Um, I've actually had good good luck with uh, graphic artists from out of the country. I, there's a place called uh, Logotournament.com, and I had logos created and, and uh, artwork for badges and things like that created by people from other countries. It's also a great opportunity for professors to get their uh, students involved. So yeah, I, that would be a, a fine thing to propose. Okay, so back to funding guidelines. Now, we you'll have access to the funding for 18 months. But we're really looking for you to propose a one-year project. We know that once it, you, you learn that you can start, you can't necessarily start on day one, so we give you 18 months to spend the money, right? But don't give us a two-year proposal or a three-year proposal. You might have, you might tell us about things that would happen in the second year. We're only going to fund one year. And if the results in that one year aren't going to be enough for you to prove the concept and be ready to apply for external funding, it's not that likely. Now, it can happen that you can say, this is what I'm going to do in year one. And you can do it. And we'll say, wow, that was really good. And you'll say, I'd like to apply for this in year two. That's fine, but you'll be in competition that second year with everybody else, all the new ideas that come in. So no guaranteed funding longer than one year, but you can have 18 months from the start date to spend that money. I see questions and uh, comments coming in. Okay, thanks, Mary Dean, for asking if there are samples. Uh, the answer is yes, we have some sample proposals, but we have made a couple of tweaks to this. So you can't really just follow those precisely. We had 
problems before was we sort of combined innovation and impact on learning. And then the reviewers saw something that would have impact on learning and gave it a high score, even though it wasn't innovative. So we would have we had some issues where sometimes the it, it got good scores from the reviewers, but then the directors looked at it and said, "Well, that's not innovative. You know, we can't really put our coil innovate, innovative seal of approval on that because there's no real innovation there." So we separated the two. We separated: is it innovative, and is it going to improve learning? And when you get both of those now, you know, if you don't get one of those, it'll it'll lose points and it won't compete very favorably. In the end, we get lots of good proposals. We fund about one third of our proposals, which is great. It's hard, hard to find any funding source that where the where the percentage is that high. Uh, but the, it ends up being very competitive. The the top few stand out. Then there's a, a you know a, a nice big chunk in the middle, and so you really want to be sure that you uh, dot all the I's, cross all the T's, make sure that you hit all the marks as we as you submit your proposal. So, um, ba -ba -ba -ba. okay, so <clears throat> Brad says he's going to add some others. And how many do you receive each period? I think we, we normally receive about 20 or 30, and we normally fund somewhere between 5 and five and 10, uh, depending on the size of the proposals. The proposals can be as high as $50,000, but they don't have to be that high. <clears throat> and sometimes we, we may have a little, you know, certain amount of money left over, uh, somebody else down, you know, below that could could squeeze in because they're not up at fifty thousand, and it doesn't always take fifty thousand. One of the one of the areas on which you'll be rated, and you'll see that soon, has to do with the cost effectiveness. So if you can do a thing for twenty thousand uh, or fifty thousand, you're going to be a lot more cost effective if you can do it for twenty thousand. So you'll get more points in that category, and that'll make you more likely to to uh, get funded. So when it comes time to proposal review, we, we always uh, put out a call for reviewers. We accept faculty members, staff, students, and we end up with usually a nice team of about 25 people who review proposals. They review multiple proposals. They use the scoring criteria that we're about to show you, and they award points. Those points are totaled. And then we come together as a group. We, we bring all these scores together in a spreadsheet. When I say we, I mean Brad. Brad is really a, a, does the yeoman's work on all of this. He puts together an excellent spreadsheet. We look for outliers. We, uh, we discuss outliers. We, we have a meeting then of all the reviewers who can make it, some face-to-face -face and some from a distance. We talk about the discrepancies in scores as, such as they are. And we, we come up with numbers we can we all uh, can agree with. For example, if I was a particularly high or low on one proposal, we might have a conversation. And uh, another reviewer might say, well, this is why I gave that a different rating than you did. And I might say, oh, yeah, I can see that. I didn't think of that before. And I might change my number. So there's one point at the end where we have a conversation, and people can kind of bring their numbers in into uh, alignment with others. After that, we have a numeric process where we sort them and look at the top ones. And we say, OK, well, it's obvious we're going to fund these. And then we talk about the ones that are close. And uh, we go from there. Then the recommendations of that review committee go to the COIL directors uh, who look at those. And then we make recommendations up to our uh, the COIL sponsors, who are really the, the uh, vice president for outreach and, and the deans of the College of Education and College of IST. They've never changed our recommendations, I want you to know. But there is a moment at which we say, this is the batch we're ready to grant, ready to, to fund. And then they, uh, they have always just uh, blessed our recommendations. OK, so when we get down into the uh, proposal submission guidelines, you see here that we want what we want, and we specify it here. We want a cover page that has these things on it. Please help us. We have not disqualified anybody because they didn't put their email address of the PI on the cover page or anything we asked for. But please give us what we ask for so we don't have to scrounge around it and, and spend time, uh, after we've spent all this time to figure out who the winners are, spend time to find out who their financial officers are and what their contact information is. 
Uh, like I said, we're not going to, we don't want to disqualify anybody because they didn't do something uh, administrative. Uh, we're really interested in funding the best proposals, but help us out and uh, do that well. And we're looking for an abstract, 200 words, uh, the, a description of the innovation. And this, this is new. And thank you, Brad, for parking your cursor on that. I know you did that specifically to get me to call attention to that. Um, we really want you to have an opportunity to explain why it's innovative. Because when the reviewers get together, you're not there. And if they say, well, you know what? That doesn't seem like an innovation to me. People have been doing that for a decade. There may be something about it that they didn't get in the reading. So we want you to just go ahead and say, this is what makes this. This has never been done. Or it's been done, but this way, and we're doing it that way. And we think that way is going to be more effective than this way. So this section on innovation is your chance to go ahead and make your case for why you should get the points in that category and why we should understand the, that this is something new and not just more of the same applied to a different content area. OK, nothing new in the chat box. So moving down through to uh, then impact on learning. These are the two biggies, right? This is what we're all about, innovation and impact on learning. Now, so we're, we've called those out so everybody can find right where it was. Everybody sees the same thing when they're thinking about those two categories. That's different. So, Mary, in the proposals that you'll see that are examples, they didn't have that. So we give you real examples of funded proposals uh, that were scored high, that received high rankings, but they won't have these pieces. So make sure that you do these pieces, even though the samples that we give you won't have those uh, as, as pieces. <clears throat> All righty then. You're welcome. So moving on to the narrative. Now the narrative itself is five pages. So everything above that line can be beyond the five pages, but the next chunk here has to be in, within five pages. Uh, so, and that should have these sections. Make sure you describe what the innovation is. Uh, although you've had a chance to really explain why it's innovative up above, but explain what it is you're trying to build. We're looking for research and development projects, not just development projects. So we want research questions. We want a list of research questions saying that we're going to, if you're building a tool, we're going to build this and we're going to do research to answer these questions and be specific. We want an explanation of the significance of the work, why you think that work's going to be important. A brief description of the research design methodology and data analysis procedures in five pages. You know, you can't say everything you might want to say about the research methodology. I've seen more than five pages spent just specifying a research methodology and why that was the right way to go for a certain study. So we just want you to say it's going to be this kind of a design uh, for these reasons. Here's how we're going to anal analyze the data. Data analysis will, would include these kinds of techniques, that sort of thing. Uh, if it's a good idea and you have good research questions and it seems doable, if in fact the, the methodologies you need some help with that, we can provide help. So after, I'm not saying turn in a weak proposal, but um, you know we can also provide and will provide help to funded proposals. Uh, if you need help in beefing up a research design, we may make that uh, perhaps a, a stipulation that we're, we're, we'd like to fund this, but we want you to talk to these people about research methodology. Okay, and by the way, don't be offended by that. I, I would welcome that help too. I've been uh, a researcher for a long time and I still know that there's a lot I don't know and would welcome somebody saying, we're going to give you money, but we want you to, and we want to improve your study by working with these people. Okay, so I think the rest is fairly straightforward. We got description of the need for funding. Uh, we have plans for submission of this. In other words, so why do you need the money when we get down into these uh, other bullets? Why do you need the money? What are you going to do to disseminate your work? We want, uh, one of our goals is that COIL and Penn State get some good PR out of this, that people hear the words COIL and Penn State and they associate it with online innovations. If we think you've got a great idea, you're going to build something, we also want you to tell other people about it. So maybe there are professional associations in your field and you want to be at their conferences or in their journals. Or maybe you, you have, they have uh, great online learning, online communities or something. You're going to be 
part of, but we'd like to hear your plan for dissemination as well. So I think the, the rest of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, a proposed timeline. So a proposed timeline, again, you don't have a lot of pages. <clears throat> so just say, you know, in the first four months, we're planning on doing this. In the next four months, we'll do this and this. So quarters by semesters, whatever makes sense to you. But just sort of lay it out so that we, as we should be funded, when we start working on this, you say you're going to have these things done in the first three months. At the end of three months, we expect to hear from you that those three things, those things are done. We want a way to be able to help you stay on track and finish things. And by the way, sometimes it's not going to happen. It's going to take 18 months, and we understand that. Now, the references, I want you to notice that this reference section is outside of that five-page narrative. So you can give us those, the, the, the references, if you like, without having that uh, count against your five pages, if you need to mention uh, references in your proposal. Supporting material. You can put other things in your proposal or with your proposal, but you can't be guaranteed that people are going to spend time to invest, invest the time and energy it takes to understand those other pieces. So the supporting materials are kind of at, at your own risk. Um, you know, not at, there's not that much risk other than the time that you put into those, but we can't guarantee that reviewers will be able to spend time with that. Uh, brief summaries of the team members' capabilities would probably be a good idea, because as you'll see when we get into the criteria, one of the things that reviewers award points for is whether or not that team is going to be able to do that job, and by the way, for that amount of money. So if, you, if it involves building tools, you want to make sure that you describe the skills of tool builders. If it involves research and certain types of uh, research methodologies and certain types of analyses of data, you want, to prove, you want to tell us that you have people on that team that are capable of doing those kinds of analyses. So that's a good use of supporting materials. And if, if, it, if it becomes controversial whether or not people can do that, we do go into those supporting materials to try and look for that evidence. <clears throat> budget too. The budgets on these can be very, very simple. All right. So a lot of grant making, the budget is, is huge and horrendous, and the specificity is is crazy. There's a tool that Penn State has, Sims, that's used for developing budgets. You don't know how to do that, probably. I don't know how to do that, but my financial officer does. So as you start putting together a proposal. You go to your financial officer and say, look, all I need is this kind of money for travel to two conferences, this money for a, a graduate assistant, and this. And they'll pop it into a budget so it'll come out in the, in the appropriate format. But again, these, these are not great big things. Um, they'll also know if you, go, if you go through your financial officer, since you'll be going through your financial officer, they'll know the right rates to use, and they'll know that if you're going to put salary in there for somebody, they're going to put fringe in there for somebody. So we had the first semester, we had a, an instance where put, people put in salary but not fringe. And they ended up charging, trying to charge both. And that got awkward. Right? We don't want it to be awkward. So take your budget to your financial officer. Have them produce uh, this very simple budget in the uh, SIMS tool. Now it says, yeah, don't forget to include fringe. You don't have to include indirect costs. This is Penn State money staying at Penn State, so we don't have to charge the indirect costs, which will help a lot, because that adds up, uh, as many of you know. OK, so if you're, if you're budgeting for graduate assistance, that fourth bullet under the uh, budget, first budget spreadsheet, remember to budget, if you're giving an assistantship, you budget for the stipend and the tuition. Or if you have a way to pay for the tuition or the stipend through department funds, go ahead and say that. Uh, but but if, you're, if you want both, you have to budget for it. No surprises in the end. What you budget for, when we award money, if there was something you meant to have in there that you didn't get in there, we're, we're not going to create money to, uh, to pay that. That's going to be a problem that you, uh, your department college program will need to solve. OK. so. Uh, if, you, if there's a narrative, you can submit with the budget if it needs it. It may not need much of a, a narrative. <coughs> Often it's fairly straightforward. It might say something like, you know, money for conferences is based on $150 a night for hotel, 
uh, you know, three nights per conference, airfare at whatever. So that's the kind of detail we might be looking for. The dissemination plan can be, again, that's, this is separate from the rest of it. You mentioned dissemination in the proposal, but if you want uh, to have a brief statement of how you're going to let others know, you can. Submission, as we already told you, happens at the uh, rig, uh, sub coil rig submission form under that coil rig uh, menu up above. Ah, PDF format. Thank you, Brad. Uh, originally, we accepted Word documents or PDFs, and that gets awkward too. So give us just a PDF. We don't want to have to create that. And, um, and uh, you know, so give us a PDF. The, uh, as Brad's pointing out here, Mary, is where you would find that highly rated proposal. We might actually put more than one up there. And we've had a request to put more than one out there. The next section deals with expectations of grant uh, recipients. This has changed a little bit from the beginning, but basically we want you to know if you get money from COIL to do this work, we expect that you will post your project abstracts. You have to communicate about this. <clears throat> as I mentioned, Penn State wants to do great things for learning. We also want to become recognized as a place where exciting people like you are working and doing good things in terms of innovations in online learning. So we want to be able to point to your project and say, see, here's a great thing that's happening at Penn State. So we want abstracts. We want progress reports. We want bio sketches of members and things like that. And we'll ask you for those as a, as a project rolls out. Um, we expect you to, we have the TLT symposium. We have COIL research symposia. We expect that you, principal investigator, or a representative, if necessary, uh, will be there to talk about your project so that we can share that with other people at Penn State so we get to know each other and what we're all working on. We expect that you'll probably publish uh, about this and or present at conferences. And of course, you have to adhere to the, to the requirements for spending money and for intellectual property. So nothing, you can't buy anything with COIL money that you couldn't buy with other Penn State money. And the fact that it was produced under a COIL grant doesn't mean that we still don't have to discuss intellectual property ownership with any students and other faculty members who will be involved in the project. So the same intellectual property and financial policies apply to the COIL rigs as well. And if you're funded, we'll expect you, principal investigator, to, in a following round, to be a COIL review, rig reviewer. You will know the process really well. You will recognize a good proposal because you wrote one. And we expect that you will give back to this community who uh, donated time to review your proposal. Any questions about that? OK, here's where we tell you. Here's where we tell you what's on the test, right? I, I believe in rubrics, and I believe in sharing the rubrics with the people you want to perform. So here's what we do. So this is, shows the scoring criteria. The reviewers will end up rating your proposal using a Qualtrics survey that has these categories with these words on them with this many points for each category. So I'm telling you right now that for innovation, that's a 10-point category. And when the reviewers are awarding those 10 points, they're going to be reading these three questions. They're going to ask themselves, does the proposal represent innovation that has the potential for long-term impact. They're going to ask themselves the second question, the third question. Now, we don't need to march all the way through these, but if I were you, and I can't be because I'm a COIL director, so I can't even compete, but if I were you, I would be looking at those questions and I would be answering those questions in my five pages because I would know that that's the basis upon which points will be awarded. Those are the things, by the way, it's not, I don't mind teaching to the test when the test covers the right things. So this is what we want coil rigs to do. So this is why we're sharing it with you. We want coil rigs to be all of these things. So we're sharing the questions and we're sharing the, the uh, extent to which we value those things comparatively by sharing the points with you as well. So I think, uh, I imagine many of you, uh, you might not have two monitors, so you might not be scrolling, be, uh, looking at this in a, in a separate window. But we can just scroll down through those. We've got innovation for 10 points, enhancing learning for 10 points. Then we've got alignment with COIL themes. Um, so, so this is one that's worth talking about here. So 
we're trying to move Penn State forward. We care deeply about the world campus and what it can accomplish. We care deeply about what goes on in classrooms. And we've sort of been thinking for the two years that we've been in existence about what are those things that we might really want to try and promote. And it seems that the big things that, that will separate quality learning experiences in the future or will benefit the institutions that provide them are personalization. And to what extent does this allow somebody to learn differently than the person that might be uh, taking the course next to them? Access. Does this have the potential to increase access to high quality higher education? Quality at scale. You know, can we do a good job with large numbers of students? Um, for example, the massive open online course kinds of thing. If you can produce high quality learning to tens of thousands of people, that's a very desirable kind of a thing. So there's five points for this alignment with one or more of those themes. It doesn't have to hit all of those buttons, but if it does have something to do with personalization, access, and quality at scale, you have an additional five points that can be awarded there. Okay, then we get down into the, how well prepared the team is to do the job for five points. The applicability, you know, does it, is it, this applicability is worth discussing too. So you're doing it to impact this class, but this class might be a lot like this class. And if you impact, do something that helps this class, it might have benefits over here and over here and over here and over here. So applicability slash transferability is, does this have potential to do good things beyond the, uh, the sort of the pilot uh, instance context in which you're going to implement that. Then we get into cost effectiveness. You know, is it, is it good impact for the money? Feasibility, can the team really pull this off given the, the people they have and the money and the time they have? <clears throat> and then the research evaluation plan. You know, is this going to be some, is there going to be, are they going to be able to produce quality research that does validate the idea that they're working on? Potential to generate ex additional external funding is, is uh, category number nine here. These are called research initiation grants, and they are seed grants designed to produce other funding that will do good things for Penn State and for learning. So that's another five points is awarded. Is, does this project have legs? Can this project you know, bring in additional funding, lead to more development, more research, more um, you know, power? And then dissemination plan. Are you gonna, and that's, again, the smallest the lowest number of points are for dissemination plan because that's the, uh, I mean, we care less about that, but we care about that enough to, to include it in there. With that, uh, again, we have another link to the high, highly rated proposal. We have uh, the call for reviewers down there. For more information, you can uh, see recorded sessions from other dates. That's the April one. Uh, you participated in this one. I doubt you're going to want to do that. But other people who don't participate in this live session will come here and maybe see the link to this session. All right, so that's pretty much it. Brad, I'm going to first ask you to say, what did I miss? What did I uh, not give enough emphasis? How can you, uh, do you want to enhance the uh, discussions that we've had so far before we open it for questions? Honestly, I don't think you missed anything, Kyle. Um, as we're going through, you know, just to, to reinforce that um, at the very end of this page, there's a link to the, uh, the meeting we have with the reviewers from the last session where we walk them through how to review the proposals. And essentially, you'll hear a repeat of what Kyle just walked you through. So it gives you a good idea of what you need to do to increase your scores and have a better chance of funding for this project. If you just make certain that you hit tick each one of those boxes uh, for the points that are listed at the bottom, you have an, uh, and you can make a solid case for each one of those, you have a solid uh, chance of, of being funded. Uh, but I think you ran through all of it, Kyle. Thanks. They have to keep me on script, and that's why that whole page is right there, so I, so I don't uh, get too far off. All right, are there other questions that anyone has at this point? Okay. Someone has tuition and stipend from another place. Can you budget more stipend for him or her? So are you saying like to, to take a, uh, like a research assistantship from a level uh, 9 to a level 10 
or something like that? Can you bump up the level of a research assistantship? Yes. Uh, yes, I think that would be appropriate. Um, it would be. And we also have people sometimes hire people as wage payroll too. So we often end up hiring wage payroll people. Let me give you a little bit of warning about that. So to hire wage payroll people, we actually have to post a position. So even if you know that um, there's somebody you want to do that job, the job's going to have to be posted. That's just a little, it's not like me to be a downer, but you know, it's good to know that going in. That if you do hire wage people, you'll have to do that. If you have a graduate assistant who's moving into a different graduate assistant role, if this person was a grad assistant, you know, for you, and now you create this new grad assistantship and they move into it, you don't have to post for that position, but you'll probably have to post for the one that you, that you fill. So we also, I mentioned financial policies and uh, intellectual property policies. We also have to follow all the human resource policies. We also, I shouldn't say have to, I mean, it's probably a good thing but it may not seem like it at the time. You're welcome, Leo. Other questions? So if there are other members of your team that you think ought to uh, participate in one of these conversations, I'll say that there'll be another one on Wednesday that'll be led by Brad. So if you wanna see it done right, uh, stop in on Wednesday. What time is that, Brad? I can check it too here. I can't because I quit my calendar and quit other things to make my computer run quickly here. I'm not hearing you. You may still be muted. Would, yeah. It would help if I turn my mute off. Uh, yes, it will be three to four tomorrow. Uh, we will also be taking the recording of this session and replacing that link at the bottom of the RFP page. Uh, where it currently links to our April session. Uh, we'll be replacing it with this one in, in the next few hours. Okay, so thanks to uh, all of you for participating. If there are any other questions, you go ahead and uh, uh, open your mics or raise your hands or type in the chat box. But if I, we don't hear any, we'll call it a session. Okay, great. You're very welcome. We're happy to do this. I think it's a great program. We've got 26 and a half uh, funded projects already, and it's really, uh, it's really makes me proud when I hear those projects report, talk about the things they've done. So I'm proud of Penn State for producing this kind of money, proud of people like you for taking advantage of it. So thanks, and uh, see you on down the line. Let me just say quickly, if you have any questions that come up, specific questions while you're putting your proposals together, don't hesitate to co to contact Kyle or I uh, to ask about them. We're, we're more than glad to help you in the development. And as I said, if you, if you need help finding collaborators, so we don't all, one of the things we're trying to break down here by bringing faculty, staff, and students together is you may not know the people in the university libraries if you want to partner with libraries. You may not know people in the teaching and learning with technologies group who you might want to partner with. So come to us and say, you know, I'm thinking of doing this. We sure would be great to have collaborators in. Uh, or we might even be able to say, oh, if you're doing that, you might want to consider collaborators in the world campus. It might not have occurred to you. Another thing is we have this uh, new COIL. Um, yes, there you go. Brad, re he reads my mind, too. That's another great thing. So we created a new thing called this COIL connector. If you go to the COIL website, you'll find an invitation to explore this new tool. Uh, and if you go to, I'll, I'll type it in at the, uh, at the bottom here in the chat box. If you go to coil.intronetworks.com, uh, actually I should be coil.intronetworks.com slash uh, pound sign startup. I'll put that back in there again. HTTP colon slash 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 pound Right up. That should get you to a place where you can enter a four-part profile that talks about your strengths, the things you're interested in, the, uh, the things you'd like help with, the things you can help other people with, and it'll end up plotting you on a, this sort of, they call it this uh, connections view, plots you on like a pin cushion with you at the center. 
So you'll fill out this form on the left, a little simple form to log in. Uh, after you get there, you end up as the center of, of your own uh, universe here. You end up at the middle of this pin cushion, and the people who have things in common with you gravitate toward the center near you. And you can um, click on someone else's pin and find out more about that person. See the things that you had in common, for example. Okay, so I had, uh, you want me to share my screen? Or you... Okay, yeah, I think you're going to have to stop sharing yours. Yeah, I, I, I've got my password written down somewhere. Oh, this is the first. Usually it's me who fumbles and Brad who comes to my rescue. So I think you're going to have to stop sharing first, but I could probably make you stop sharing. Okay, and I'll share mine. And I'll share, uh, I'll share Chrome. So, are you guys seeing my, uh, are you seeing my Coral's birthday? Okay. No. Uh, we see it. Oh, back okay, so uh, that's top a long window. window. All right, so let me just bring it up into... Okay, great. So this is the is. Uh, coil connector. I'm going to enter in here. And it's, this does a lot of different things, but the, the thing that we really uh, are looking forward to most is this ability to find and connect with people. So if I go to view my connections, it brings me this pincushion view. I am this blue dot at the very center, but I can find people that have people and projects that I have a lot in common with. Uh, by scrolling over the ones that are near me. If I click on one, here's my friend Bart Purcell. Uh, it turns out he's right next to me because we have these things in common. So we both have expertise in the area of MOOCs. We both have interest in peer assessment, higher order assessment, instructional design, and data analytics. So you can then, uh, you know, you could invite that person to meet with you. You could uh, send uh, communications and so on. But you can also create interest groups. So we've created some interest groups based on things we know people are, are interested in. And this is a, an interest group, this MOOC uh, grouping study, Ristova, is one that was created for a COIL-funded study. And in that, it's, it gathers members, and you can have forums, your own forums, and, and uh, establish resources and things. But we can also do database searches and find the people. We can use this to find all the people who uh, are, you know, might be interested in big data and MOOCs, or people who are interested in flipped classroom, or people who have, uh, are experts in research methodology, or, or, or. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen, or ask Brad to uh, stop it for me, and we'll sign off. But if you go, if you, I, I sort of encourage you to go to coil.intranetworks.com. We're trying to create sort of a who's who in terms of online learning at Penn State. And uh, we'd love to have you uh, as a member of that community. We just opened this on Thursday, so it's not even a week old. Uh, and uh, we haven't really extended a full invitation out there yet, but we will be doing that. OK. So Brad, you want to stop sharing my screen? And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll see if I can figure out how to get back there. All right, here I am, and I did stop. I'll stop sharing. Okay, great. So with that said, uh, we've hit our one-hour mark. Thank you for your patience, and we will see you down the road.